All right, hello everyone. So today we are going to talk about um, gaining acceptance to CRNA school on the spot. And you may be thinking, uh, Jenny, this sounds too good to be true. <laughs> um, but I can tell you and assure you it does happen. Um, yes, it doesn't happen often. However, it does happen. And I'm going to kind of share with you what I have found to be true for the reasons why this tends to happen to certain candidates versus not everyone. Um, we'll kind of get into it. So this kind of goes back to kind of how prepared and ready are you? Um, I don't know if you, if you had seen the video I did. Uh, was that yesterday I did that? Um, I can't remember. The days are all blending together. Huh. I think it was yesterday. So if you also, I've done a video every day. Um, I've had a few people reach out asking where these videos are. It is in Facebook. Um, now Facebook likes to hide things. So um, again, I think the easiest way to combat that so you get all these videos, all the trainings that we're doing this week is to make sure that you are subscribing to our notifications, which is through that like little, little like three little dot area. Um, you can have a drop down menu and hit subscribe so you get all of our notifications and that we don't miss them. So, but I promise you all the recordings are in Facebook, but they may be hiding from you um, due to the algorithms that Facebook puts in place. So but they are there. So definitely if you have not seen the video on how uh, prepared or are you ready to apply to CRNA school, definitely uh, take a look, take a watch. But yeah, so how prepared are you? And again, have you really addressed your blind spots, which is where I, what I kind of covered in that last video. Um, a lot of, you don't know what you don't know, which yes, that's frustrating when you think you know, you think you're ready. And then you find out after the fact that no, maybe I wasn't as teed up as I thought I was because I wasn't aware of certain things that I was missing. And so again, that's where Sierra Nance Corp Academy really focuses in its attention towards its applicants. We help you look at, for those blind spots. We help you realize maybe what you don't know, what you should know prior to going into the application process. It is important, you guys, to start your preparation years ahead of time because the reason why it might seem ridiculous to start two years ahead of the time. However, if you wait till you're already ready to apply and you realize, oh, I missed something, well, you don't have a lot of time to pivot. You don't have a lot of time to shift. That could be retaking a course or, um, you know, changing ICUs. And again, anything that's done last minute like that, it's just not going to play in your favor. And so this is why the preparation planning phase, whatever you want to call it, needs to happen at least one to two years prior to your application, meaning prior to even getting to your application, you should have been planning for CRNA school for at least a year ahead of time, if not two or three. Um, I really think the candidates who get accepted on the spot have done a very good job in this area. They're the candidates who have been planning for this for probably longer than two or three years. And so not that you need to do that, but um, I do think, you know, they say like, what is it? I don't know, probably going to get this term or like the, you know, not the slow one wins the race, but like the turtle wins the race. I don't know, but like kind of slow and steady wins the race. Uh, maybe that's the term I'm looking for. And it's, again, I, I spoke about this in the last video too. Sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. And the reason why slowing down can be, um, or at least taking your time to plan and prepare could be more beneficial is because you see your blind spots. You can slow down to realize what you don't know and then do those things. And again, a lot of these things take time to do. So you have to allow yourself that time. And trust me, it's stressful when you find out you need to do something and you don't have time to do it. It's stressful. So I don't want to, that to happen to any of you guys. Um, the other way that you can get accepted on the spot is by very good practice. This is different than preparation. Preparation is the planning that comes with preparing like your, like what you need to do be, to become a great candidate for CRNA school. Practicing your interview skills and practicing um, self-awareness is something that actually does take a lot of time as well. Um, these interview panels are very well versed in telling who has memorized versus who actually understands the knowledge. They can sniff it out. Like they're like those, like, uh, they're, <laughs> I don't mean, like they're like those, uh, drug sniffing dogs. They can sniff you out pretty easily if you have tried to memorize from Google. So again, practice is not, um, practice to memorize, but it's practice for self-awareness. It's practice. Um, so you can critique yourself and hone in on areas of weakness. It's practice to get used to speaking out loud. It's practice to kind of hear yourself think. Um, I don't know about you, but 
I definitely develop a muscle memory and when I don't like public speaking, I hate it. In fact, it's terrifying to me. And I think most people probably would say that about public speaking. Um, but the more you do it, the more you put yourself out there, it's kind of like, yeah, the fear is still there, but your muscles take over. If that makes sense. Like you don't mentally, um, you're not mentally aware of how nervous you are because your, your mouth's just moving. <laughs> like, it's just like a, it's a physical thing versus an emotional thing, if that makes sense. And so when you practice your interview, you can easier, you can calm your nerves better because you can separate the emotions from the physical task of interviewing. And that only happens with time and with practice. And yeah, you don't need a hundred mock interviews. I'm not saying that at all, but practicing in front of you a mirror with yourself, record yourself on zoom. Like I'm doing right now. I mean, I'm looking at myself and when I first started doing these types of sessions, it felt really weird to like look at myself and talk. And I'm like, Ooh, this is kind of weird. Like, hi, Jenny. Um, but really in reality, I'm critiquing myself. And when I listen to my podcast and listen to my YouTube channels, I do cringe because, um, is a common word I use and I hate it, but now I'm aware of it. So I can be more cognizant in my speaking and what I'm saying and realizing that um is an awkward way of me being unsure, right? And so when I'm recognizing I'm doing this, it allows me to address it. Okay, so I, you know, if I look back to my very first podcast to my podcast now, I've probably gotten better. Have I completely improved? Probably not, <laughs> but it's a work in progress. But you see how long it's taking me to kind of, recognize and pick up on things and try to work on them. Practice. Practice does take time. It does not happen overnight. It happens over a period of time. And so not that you need to start practicing your, your interviews, you know, in the mirror a year out, but I think at least six to eight months prior to interviewing, you should be starting to practice and start off with practicing in the mirror, answering some questions, doing some personality tests, understanding, getting some self-awareness is, um, is to, what are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? Um, the self-awareness aspect to you guys also takes time because ask your coworkers, ask your friends, like as awkward as it might be, they probably have some, they probably see some of your blind spots. And it's kind of goes back to the saying of like, you know, your friends know you best. That's why, because they see your blind spots, right? They see things that you easily miss because you're so laser focused on looking at yourself in the mirror that you don't see you don't see behind your head, right? I've never seen behind my head unless I'm like holding a mirror up, <laughs> you know, but they, they can see the back of your head all the time. So again, they have more awareness of things that you're not aware of because again, you have, you have a blind spot. Um, so getting accustomed to what that is and then addressing it. Don't just know what your weaknesses are. You have to take action and start addressing those things because the program is going to ask you, okay, well, that's a weakness. What are you doing about it? And ha how has this impacted you in your practice? How do you foresee this impact in your CRNA practice? You need to be thinking those things through. Thinking on your toes, that, that kind of goes into practice because the more you think about how you would answer a question, we're not, they're not looking for um, you to re rehearse your answers and give them a rehearsed answer. In fact, that sounds pretty bad and very unnatural. I mean, think about it. If I was sitting here reading from a, a CRNA Corp Academy, it gives you access to one-on-one mock interviews, mock interviews are recorded. I mean, if I was just to read, don't get me wrong, I actually have notes <laughs> in front of me, but I very rarely like, and same with my podcast and like my YouTube channel, it makes me nervous speaking on the cuff because I'm like, man, Jenny, I'm going to screw up. I just know it. But I also know that if I go off the cuff and just talk the way I normally would to like me and you, if you're in, in a room with me and yeah, it's not going to be perfect. It's way more relatable, way more personable and enjoyable to listen to versus someone reading from a script, right? And so think about that when you're in the interviews and <laughs> trying to rehearse what you're going to say on why do you want to be a CRNA, know that there should be some realness to it. They should not just think you practice this a hundred times and now you're just, and it's okay if you don't get it exactly how you practice. In fact, it's probably better that you didn't because it would sound more natural, more real. So thinking on your toes, it's not easy to do. Um, but the more you've thought about what you want to say, even if it's just like having bullet points, kind of like what I do when I do my lives, I have no idea what's going to come out of this mouth half the time. Like half the time I'm like, oh, well, I totally forgot that. Or I said that and I wasn't even planning on it, but you know, it still serves its purpose. Right. And so don't worry about exactly what you're going to say, but you need to be thinking about what you're going to say. So either way you get the point across, right? You just got to get your point across. So thinking on your toes is easier to do if you've at least 
planned and thought about possibilities for them to ask you. You can have all the practice questions in the world that could be directly from the school itself, but they probably won't ask you any of those questions because these programs pull from a giant bank of questions. And guess what? They mix up their panels. Um, some years they have guest interview panels that didn't that weren't there last year. And so just because you had someone tell you, oh, they'll ask you this, this and this. You're not guaranteed to be asked X, Y and Z. Now, schools do tend to have favorite questions. But again, it's not really about knowing the question they're going to ask you as much as it is thinking of the big picture. So if they ask you a really specific question, you can think on your toes and give them a good answer. All right. And I, I've stressed the critical care knowledge, but I, um, I actually just did a podcast episode with Richard, which was awesome. I'm so excited. It airs on February 26th or 23rd. Sorry, 23rd. Um, but he made a good point in that episode as well as, you know, people emphasize critical care knowledge and including myself. And I do think knowledge is a big part of it. And it is a big part. However, it's a lot about the how and the presentation of it that really can make or break you. Because again, you can try to memorize uh, critical care knowledge and it kind of, it, it's you can see right through that. Um, but it's how you use your time in the unit to build this skill that really becomes apparent to the interview panel. And they do, they do assess more than just your critical care knowledge. That is not the only piece. Again, they assess, assess whether you're a team play, player, whether you have leadership roles, how you handle conflict, whether you get defensive. They're looking at the whole picture. So your knowledge aspect is just one piece of the puzzle. And I think I may have mentioned this last time that, you know, schools who don't even ask any clinical scenario questions at all, it's because they know that's teachable information, but emotional intelligence and how you handle yourself in stressful situations takes longer to, um, it's just not a skill that's easily taught. It takes self-awareness. It takes you, like you have to teach it to yourself. No one can teach you how to act. You have to then focus on how you are acting and make a change, right? It's like that change, the emotional intelligence. Don't get me wrong. You can build on your own emotional intelligence, but no one can make you do that. You have to want to do it. And you yourself have to take actionable steps to make that happen for yourself. So that is why these schools are looking for that inherent emotional intelligence because they know it takes a self-motivated person to make it happen for themselves and they can't force you to change who you are, right? But they can tell you to know X, Y, and Z for a test. And so some schools don't worry about that as much because um, they know, again, that that's not, that knowledge is teachable, but you have to, you have to have it uh, you have to have the desire there within you to improve your own emotional intelligence. And it can happen. I mean, I don't think any of us start off emotionally intelligent, if I'm being perfectly honest. Like, holy moly. Like, I think back to the way I was when I was even 21. I was like a uh, roller coaster. <laughs> um, so and I'm glad I'm not like that today. But just know that you don't always start off having great emotional intelligence. And just because you don't does not mean you can't develop it. But it does mean that you have to start practicing self-awareness so you can build on those skills on that skill set. All right. So I, t I mentioned a little bit about how you present it. And the reason why how you present your critical care knowledge or present yourself matters is because people are naturally geared towards picking up on little um, little clues, you know, uh, body language. And again, when you use fillers in your language, um, maybe it means you're nervous. If you don't make eye contact, if you use your hands all the time, <laughs> you know, I use my hands a lot, but you know, maybe the faster I use my hands, maybe the more excited I am. And I don't know how to go into an interview and just do this the whole time. And, you know, cause they're like, whoa, they need to chill out a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's a little, you know, step it down a notch. Um, so it's okay if you use your hands, but just be cognizant of what you do and make sure that you're not doing it so much that it's a giant distraction. So again, how you present who you are can really kind of clue them in on um, how aware you are of yourself, how, um, yes, you need confidence, but are you overly confident? And that's a really fine line. And it, we talked about that today in the podcast too, because I think people, I've had students reach out to me and they're like, I don't understand. They told me I was too confident. Like, how is that even possible? And it is kind of, you know, you always say, yeah, you need to be confident, but there is such thing as too much confidence. And what's unfortunate about that is it could have just been some, a little bit of body language, a little bit of like tone in your voice that maybe they were fearful you weren't teachable. And the thing is when you're overly confident, it can make them feel like, well, maybe they're not open to being teachable. Maybe they're not open to being a novice again because they're so sure of themselves that what if someone corrects them? What if they get defensive? And they will assess for that. So 
reflect on that. And it's okay if you are confident in yourself as an ice nurse, that's amazing. And high five, like that's, I, I love that. But you also need to be careful on how you present that. And what would you do if someone criticized you? What would you do if someone told you you were wrong? And see how that feels, you know, let that sit with you a little bit and see if like, maybe actually have someone do a little interview on you and correct you. Tell them like, hey, if you notice something that I say incorrectly, can you point out and correct me? And see how that feels and how you, how you handle that. Because then it allows you to say, oh, I didn't like that. It made me feel really icky. And I could tell my tone of voice changed. I got kind of sweaty. I got uncomfortable. And I got a little defensive. And so now it allows you to address that problem and to get down to why the root cause of that is, you know? And, you know, so that's what I encourage you to do. To be aware of how you present yourself, how you present your knowledge. And, um, and again, back to the practice piece. I mean... Practice, you got to practice. You got to be comfortable speaking and being put in an uncomfortable position, right? Um, but this also comes down to some key characteristics, personality characteristics that these schools are all looking for. And I'm only going to name, I probably can't name them all, but I'm going to name the ones that came to mind when I was thinking about personality characteristics. And if I'm speaking to you, you're like, oh my gosh, Jenny, I don't know I, I, if I fit all these categories. Don't worry. I'm pointing them out so you can make an active point to think about how this fits within your own personality realm. Um, you, you're going to have higher attributes of some and lower of others, and we're all a little different on the spectrum, right? I mean, some of us may have our discipline down here, but maybe some of us are extremely adaptable up here, and the person who's extremely dis disciplined may not be as adaptable. Does that make sense? And so it's okay if you feel like some of these may not be your strong points, I guarantee some of them will be your strong points. And that's where you need to put your focus. And as far as selling yourself to these programs, because I, I we all have something unique to bring to the table. We're not going to be 100% in all these categories. So don't let this list make you think you need to be, okay? And just like anything, over time, you can build these skills. You can build discipline. Why not? You can, There are plenty of people who go through a lot of their life without a lot of discipline and all of a sudden become these avid runners every day they're out there running. That's that's developing discipline, right? They've always had it. Did they always use it? No. But you, so all of these skills, you guys, you can develop. So discipline's one of them. Are, are you gonna be disciplined to show up when you don't want to? Being disciplined is doing something you don't like doing, doing something that does not feel good, doing something that doesn't get you instant gratification. That's discipline, okay? Going to the gym, <laughs> although I like going to the gym, although I still can't seem to get myself to do it all the time. So there you go. I don't have discipline when it comes to that realm, at least not at this point in my life. Um, I'm going to leave these up. So self-motivated. The reason why I wanted to point out self-motivation is because this is an adult learning program. No one's going to hold your hand. No one's going to hold you accountable. No one's going to make you show up to clinical. No one's going to make you show up to clinical on time, prepared, none of that. However, if you don't, you're going to have a really rough, rocky road. So you have to really be self-motivated to do what they tell you to do. Okay, this is expected of you. Okay, I have to make it happen. So you have to really own your actions and be self-motivated. You can't have anyone else outwardly putting the pressure on you. You And I actually think the vast majority of people who, who tend to even go into ICU nurses tend, tend to be self-motivated people. You tend to be kind of more type A um, type A people, in my opinion, are very self-motivated. They're like, they're, they're the go, go, go kind of people. Um, but I think that will serve you well. But I also will point out sometimes people like that tend to not know how to put on the brakes, right? And then you bring yourself out. So you have to find that fine balance of self-care, self-love, as well as staying motivated to continue to um, have the discipline to keep going, right? So it's definitely a balancing act. Um, adaptability. Man, that is one thing that if you can be adaptable in CRNA school and just as a CRNA in general, you're going to love your career. And um, people who hate change, and I don't think anyone likes change. I mean, change is stressful, right? I wouldn't say hate change. People who avoid change, people who are not open to change, or at least hearing about it, have a much harder time in this career path. Doesn't mean they can't do it. Doesn't mean they don't do it because plenty of people are, but it means you're going to have a harder time because this career path is very fluid. It's very up. It's very just always changing. You have to be adaptable. You're, you might have one assignment quickly changes. 
the patient may be stable, quickly changes. You kind of, you experience this type of uh, unpredictability working in the ICU. So you're already developing this skill by being an ICU nurse. You're developing being adaptable because stuff changes in an instant. You might have an open bed. You never know what's going to come on that open bed, right? <laughs> like maybe it's something you're not really prepared for that you've never taken, that you've never done before. So adaptability is really key um, and being able to, uh, again, kind of like roll with the punches, go with the flow, um, being okay to be un being uncomfortable is part of being adaptable. All right, that's not, there we go. Um, perseverance, I put on here because, you know, I talk about burnout a lot. And in fact, I talked about it on the app, on the podcast, and I definitely think that's an issue that should be addressed early on and it should be, it's a proactive approach to burnout. You don't want to wait till you get there to deal with it because it's much harder to ever, um, come back to baseline from that. Um, but perseverance comes into play because CRNA school will test your limits. It will test, um, and just the interview process, the journey to CRNA school, it's going to test your ability to keep going. Cause it's going to get hard. It's going to get challenging. It's going to be feel uncomfortable. It's going to be icky sometimes you're going to deal with rejections and setbacks and questions about how is this going to affect me and my personal life and my ability to have kids and I mean there's all kinds of stuff right financials I mean I've seen the questions in here it's heavy stuff there's heavy life decisions on the line when it comes to going to CRNA school it's something to be taken lightly perseverance will really help you push through a lot of the really thick hard times um, and so perseverance has to be something that you strive for. And don't get me wrong. We all need support when we need support. It doesn't mean you're always going to be that rock solid, strong person. It's okay. If you have setbacks and weaknesses and need that support, that's why you need to be okay with asking for help. That's a big part of getting through CRNA school, knowing when you need help and addressing a problem before it actually happens, like trying to be proactive in your own needs. Um, so I want to mention, uh, perseverance. People that are people that persevere tend to seek help early and often and tend to know that they have to be resourceful. They have to use their resources. And the reason why I mentioned resourceful, um, because you sometimes have to figure it out on your own. You're not always going to, again, have someone who's there to help you. You have to fall back on the resources that are available and do your own research. You could ask someone a question, but then they have to go look it up, right? So you should just look it up. I mean, if you're the one with the question, and that's why I think some people take some uh, preceptors kind of the wrong way is maybe they maybe ask a question. The preceptor's like, well, look it up. And it's because of this fact. Maybe they shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm just speaking from hearing it done to students and that kind of thing. Is sometimes students ask questions not realizing that their preceptor probably doesn't know the answer to that either. Or maybe, maybe they think that even if they do know the answer, the student should be resourceful and look it up themselves. And so, again, taking kind of being self-motivated, taking initiative and being resourceful. And if you have a question saying, I'm going to take the time to look it up myself and learn it and figure it out. And then if I have trouble or if I have, a, I have a hard time understanding it, then I will ask for clarification. But you have to take that initial step to try to own it and understand it yourself. That gets way further in this career field as far as uh, respect goes when you're, I'm just talking from like a student perspective when you're an SRNA than if you just don't know something you ask right away. Do some of your own digging first, try to understand something, and then you can ask questions. And that way you can have like an intelligent, or not intelligent, that sounds kind of bad framing it that way. You can have a more, um, what's the word? Just a more beneficial conversation, a conversation that will help deepen your understanding versus just very surface level. So that's my recommendation for being resourceful. Um, leadership, I think leadership plays into almost the next one I wanted to mention too, which is being a team player. Uh, being a leader means being a team player and kind of vice versa. And I really think leadership is key because you have to be willing to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to be in the spotlight and, um, you're there for your classmates. You're a team player, right? You're there for your coworkers. So the team building that you build or set the foundation when you're in the ICU will spill over to your time as an SRNA and your time as a CRNA. Other CRNAs want to work with CRNAs who are team players, who are leaders, who are people who are not afraid to take charge and do and take action. Um, so these are all skills that you build when you're working in the ICU. But I encourage you, if you're, if you're shy, if you're timid, venture out and try to put yourself out there and just see how it feels and give yourself baby steps to get there. 
Um, and I'm saying that because I was shy, I was timid, and I was a fearful of putting myself in leadership roles. I wish I would have done it sooner. Again, it's baby steps, putting your doing little tiny things until you take a big uh, role, okay? It does get easier um, the more, again, you put yourself out there and practice, right? You got to practice. You got to do it. You got to you gotta put your, make yourself uncomfortable. So I hope you guys enjoyed all these tips. Um, I also want to make you guys well aware that we help you do all of these things inside Sierra Nights Corp Academy. That is essentially why we created Sierra Nights Corp Academy. It's how our goal with Sierra Nights Corp Academy is to make you a well-prepared candidate. We really want to not just help you get into school. We want to help you succeed in school. Like there'd be no point in getting you into school if you got into school and you just were like, ah, I don't, I, I can't do this. I'm, I'm done. We really want to prepare you to, yes, be a, a knockout candidate, to get accepted on the spot. Like that, that like makes my entire year when I hear a student tell me that. Um, however, all of that would be for waste if you didn't get into school and thrive. And so a lot of what we do and a lot of what we teach, such as mindset and how, again, to have some of these characteristics, is we prepare you how to start do, being self-aware, assessing yourself, and we give you the knowledge and the understanding you need to go forward with ease and success, okay? So definitely, um, it's CRNA week. We're running a special this week. We're giving you stickers. <laughs> um, so if you want a free sticker pack, join CRNA School Prep Academy. You have until the 29th, January 29th, to join CRNA School Prep Academy and get the sticker pack. I hope to see you in there. Um, I do go live in the social wall. That's just like Facebook. I call it social wall to keep it separate. I go live in there every single week to answer your questions. Richard Wilson, who is uh, CSPA's expert contributor, contributes to our forum and social wall. Um, it's an amazing community. We do live events. We just did another group uh, mock interview coaching call. Um, we're getting ready to do a diversity inclusion session coming up as well. We just did a SRNA Q&A panel. We do all kinds of stuff. Everything that we do inside the academy is, again, to propel you towards success, to get your questions answered. We know your journey is unique. We know you need unique help and, gu and guidance and support, and we can provide that for you. So I hope to see you in there. And as a reminder, I think I have one more topic for tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow is accepted. Now what? So uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk about um, different things that you can do to kind of propel you, kind of get you ready to start school. I, we recently had a student inside our program who was, he's super gung-ho, which bless his heart, he's awesome. But I want to kind of highlight some things that you can do that would be time well spent. I also want to make sure you guys are well aware of things that you should not do um, once you get accepted to CRNA school. So that is going to be our topic for tomorrow. Thank you guys for tuning in. And then on Saturday, we're doing an open Q&A. So if you have enjoyed these sessions and you want to show up and ask me any questions, that's your day to do it. It's Saturday, um, ask me any questions, start thinking now. So you can ask me some questions. So Saturday, I'll show up and we'll do a fun live Q&A to kind of wrap up CRNA week. Um, thank you all for being part of this community. I appreciate you and thank you for giving back. It means a lot. You guys all have a wonderful day and I will see you tomorrow. All right, bye-bye.